Today's lecture of the lecture series to celebrate the National Science Week organized by the National Institute of Fundamental Studies will be delivered by Professor Wolfgang Titus. He is the program leader of the research program of primate biology of National Institute of Fundamental Studies. Today he is going to talk about primates of Sri Lanka. Hello. This presentation is all about monkey business, but serious monkey business. I want to show you why monkeys are so interesting. After all, I have been studying these monkeys for the last 50 years, and I still find some aspects of them fascinating. Monkeys are involved in our culture. They are diverse as species and subspecies, and monkeys are smart and bold. I want to share with you a few highlights about their biology. I'll give you a brief overview of the primate diversity in Sri Lanka and how to study primates from the perspective of natural selection. Let's also consider some of the monkeys' daily challenges to survival. What are the population trends in monkeys? And how do people create pest monkeys? What is the conservation status of monkeys? And finally, do people like monkeys? What is the best way to keep them safe for the future? I will start by letting Tina Fey of the Disney nature film Monkey Kingdom introduce you to my favorite the wild monkeys of Sri Lanka. At, that we study at Polonarua. Land of myth and legend. Where rocky pinnacles overlook vast tropical forests. And an abandoned city lies shrouded in jungle. The kings who once reigned here are long gone. These days, there's a new dynasty in residence, but this one is governed by the law of the jungle. Here we come, walk down the street. We get the funniest looks from everyone we meet. To get restless, there's always something new. Hey, hey, we're the monkeys, and people say we monkey around. But we're too busy singing to put anybody down. We just shine to be friendly, come watch, sing, and play. But we're the young generation, and we've got. How could you not like monkeys? What you just saw were the toke macaques. In addition to the toke macaques, we also have other primate species like the Hanuman or gray langur or the aluvandura. These are leaf eating monkeys. We also have the purple face langur or the kaluvandura that also eats most of the leaves, but they live high in the treetops and they're not easily seen. A very interesting primate is the loris, the unuhapalua because it represents an ancestral type to all primates, including man, and has survived since the age of reptiles in the Mesozoic about 70 million years ago. It is truly a living fossil, a relic in Sri Lanka. The loris is active only during the night. If you were to look for a loris in the forest, you may find it as a small animal only about 20 centimeters long. The first thing you would see is the reflection of light from its eyes it gives them an eerie and ghostly look, but the loris is harmless. It's most, it eats mostly insects. Turning to our research objectives, our aims on the primate biology program are to increase our knowledge about the biology and evolution of primates. We develop and test hypotheses uh, from the perspective of natural selection. We ask, for example, how do ecological and behavioral traits affect the survival and reproductive success of monkeys? Because these variables are the foundation for biological evolution. In a more practical sense, we also strive to develop strategies 
for the conservation of primates. If we want to understand the social dynamics among monkeys and how this affects their chances of survival and reproduction, it is imperative that we distinguish them as individuals and their associated traits. With traits, I mean their behaviors, their anatomies, and their ecologies under different environments. Also, measuring the effects of these traits on survival requires a large sample size because there's so much variation in the system. For, statist for statistical validation, therefore, we have monitored the histories of over 5,000 individually identified uh, macaques over many decades. Natural selection places a premium on individuality because within monkey society, it is very important for monkeys to distinguish one another as friends, enemies, and relations. These adult males here, for example, differ markedly in their appearance. You see how they differ in their hairdos and in the spotting patterns in their faces. They also have scars. In our records, we label monkeys with unique names to better keep track of them. Adult female topacacs differ from the males because they are smaller, about half their body size of males, and they have red faces that the males do not have. We distinguish monkeys systematically using identification cards. We note their hairdos, fur and face colors, pigment spots, and any other distinguishing feature. With such records, we can reliably identify many individuals. Once you know monkeys as individuals, you can figure out their social lives. Monkeys always live in social groups that are composed of collections of mother families. While daughters almost never leave their mother's group, the sons almost always do during adolescence to prevent inbreeding, breeding between brothers and sisters, mothers and sons. Therefore, the adult males in a group or the fathers in any monkey group are immigrants from elsewhere and they're not closely related to the females. Ecologically speaking, each group of monkeys has its own territory or piece of real estate that provides all the monkeys needs for food, water, and refuges. The older females especially have an intimate knowledge of their home range resources during times of difficult drought, for example. Where the ranges of neighboring groups overlap, they often engage in territorial disputes like, uh, like warfare. Macaques eat a variety of vegetable foods, mostly fruit, but also insects and the occasional small lizard and mammal. Their food supply is very seasonal and can be very limited in availability. Finding food requires know-how, ingenuity, and often taking of risks as shown in this film clip. The younger monkeys follow, but even the bravest hesitate over this next incredible step. Did you know monkeys could swim? Macaques have a very strict hierarchy of dominance, which serves them in when they compete for food items. And this competition can be fairly intense, as we've seen in these three different photographs here. Older monkeys know their territories fairly well, and dominant monkeys regularly exploit subordinates for food resources, as shown in this clip. A few dried berries or even a small lizard would be very welcome. The troop relies on the knowledge of older females to lead it to increasingly rare crops of fruit. But there's rarely enough to go around. Young Imelda is last to arrive at a fruit tree. 
The others have already crammed their cheek pouches with berries. In this fiercely competitive world, pouches are a great way to stash food before rivals can get to it. But Imelda spots an easy target. Poppin is older and larger than Imelda, but a much lower rank. So Imelda takes full advantage of her status. Naturally, Poppin is reluctant to cooperate, but if she resists too strongly, she risks a beating. Macaque hierarchy may seem unjust. As you have seen in these videos, it's a daily challenge for monkeys to get enough to eat. In fact, many monkeys may die when there is a shortage of food. Competition for limited food and water results in high death rates, especially among the infants and low ranking animals. Almost 50% of infants may die before they reach adulthood. Natural disasters like cyclones can affect the monkey's food supply. The cyclone in November 1978, for example, destroyed 50% of forest trees and, monkey, and many of the monkeys died from lack of food. So what all this means is that to a great extent, the number of monkeys in the forest patch is determined by the food supply. Under natural conditions, the food supply can fluctuate monthly, yearly, in the short term, but over the long term, it is fairly stable. Consequently, the long-term population of monkeys is near zero. For each year, during the birth season, the numbers increase and then the subsequent die-off. Each year, this pattern is repeated, increase and decrease, increase and decrease over many years. But if you look at the pattern over many years, it is zero population growth. What happens when humans encroach on the monkey's natural environment? Either the monkey's food base is destroyed, their forest is destroyed, and people may kill monkeys, or when humans introduce agriculture and food scraps into the monkey's environment, monkeys eat well, may survive better, and their population grows quickly. The figure shows the growth trajectories of three macaque groups over a period of 30 years. The territories of these three groups overlap, but only one of them had access to, to, to human food resources, and it grew exponentially over the 30 years and it even split twice to form two new groups. In contrast, the two groups that had only natural food in their diet, they did not grow over the 30 year time span. Where do monkeys get human food? Well-intentioned people who visit places like Polonarua or Anuradhapura um, like to feed monkeys. Unfortunately, monkeys that are fed by people lose their fear and respect of people and may develop into pest monkeys that may raid villages. Consequently, villagers retaliate and may kill the monkeys, as you see here, poison monkeys. Therefore, feeding monkeys can be a death sentence for a monkey. Unknowingly, pilgrims do not gain pin or merit by feeding monkeys, they lose it. They create pest monkeys that eventually conflict with humans. Let's take a brief look at the diversity of macaques in Sri Lanka and the risks that they face for their survival. We have three different subspecies that differ in their appearance, their anatomy, and their geographical distribution. In the dry zone, we have Macaca sinica sinica. They have relatively light fur color and short hairdos. Then in the midland and lowland rainforests, we have Macaca sinica aurifrons with golden fur color and moderately length hairdos. Then in the highlands, in a very restricted area, we have Macaca sinica opistomilas, and they have relatively dark fur, short limbs, and these bizarre umbrella-like hairdos. A recent survey of the distribution of primates by Jennifer Pastorini and colleagues 
indicated that two of the three subspecies of macaques have been virtually wiped out in their native areas because of forest destruction for agriculture and the killing of macaques. The blue areas and green ones are those where macaques have been observed, but the white areas are virtually absent of macaques. This included the macaque subspecies Macaca seneca aurifrons of the lowland and midland rainforests, as well as the hill zone macaques Macaca seneca opistomilas. These represent significant losses of biodiversity to Sri Lanka's natural heritage. Since people and monkeys often compete for the same space and food resources, we wanted to know how people who come into frequent contact with monkeys felt about their relationship to monkeys. Therefore, we undertook a survey of people's opinions in about 13 villages near our study site at Polonia. We asked how they like monkeys and what is their opinion for the best way to reduce any conflict between monkeys and people. Our survey revealed that two thirds of people liked monkeys, one third did not. And 80% of people familiar with monkeys wanted them safely translocated to a national park or a protected area, shift them from one place to another. If we were to apply democracy to managing wildlife resources, we would conclude that nature reserves or protected areas are absolutely essential for the safety and conservation of primates. Outside of such protected areas, people need to be taught how best to share space with monkeys and tolerate them and learn to safeguard their properties from damage and the nuisance that monkeys can be. And all these things are possible. Let me end my presentation on an upbeat note. I want to thank my crew of naturalists who have worked with me for over many years at Polongarua. That's Sunya Gunatilaka, Sunya Ratnaike, and Shamira Patiratna. And I want to thank the institutions listed here for their support over many years. And remember, Oglanda Honita Matakranda, Milovante Kamadena Epa, Netang Loku Prashna Vene, Oya Tamai. Thank you for your listening.